Hi, I'm Dr. Marvin Natovich. I'm a medical geneticist at the Cleveland Clinic and a professor at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Today, we're fortunate to learn from Dr. Margaret Bowman, a neurologist at the Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Bowman is a nationally recognized authority on various aspects of autism. She has done landmark work in understanding some of the basic biology of autism and has advanced the recognition of many critical issues confronting both children and adults with autism. Today, Dr. Bauman is here to speak with us about a frontier area of autism that's of immense importance, but which to date is poorly explored, of the medical challenges associated with aging and autism. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Bowman. Uh, I'm uh, Margaret Bowman. I am a child neurologist, and I'm here today to talk about a topic that perhaps is pretty unusual for a child neurologist, which has to do with aging in autism. And this is a growing area of interest, uh, particularly uh, given the increasing prevalence rates and uh, the appreciation that uh, children get to be uh, adults one of these days, and that we need to know a lot more about this as yet unexplored area. So I'm delighted to have an opportunity to discuss some of the challenges today and hopefully lead to uh, further research. Uh, as many of you know, uh, autism was first described by Leo Kanner in 1943, and for many years it's been considered primarily a childhood disorder. Uh, now it is now recognized as a lifelong disorder, and uh, recent data has suggested that in fact close to 50,000 people, individuals a year on the autism spectrum uh, will turn 18 years of age, which raises the spectrum of a, a rapid increase in the population of adults uh, uh, coming into the uh, world of research and into the world of uh, everybody else. So it's important, I think, that we really try to understand uh, more about adults uh, than we have up to this point. Um, so far, there's an increasing interest in the data that related to adults, particularly in terms of their health care issues. However, there's very little, if any, data that has to do with individuals over the age of 65. And I think there is a uh, need to learn about this, this group of uh, individuals because I think it may be able to help us understand some of the neurobiological mechanisms that up to this point we really haven't considered. Um, many, uh, many of the adults, there are, there are challenges, frankly, in terms of uh, working with the aging population and some adults because many of them no longer have family members who can talk about uh, their early childhood symptoms. So if one doesn't have a parent or a sister or a brother or some relative who can recall uh, what this individual looked like when they were younger, making a diagnosis in uh, an adult who has not been previously diagnosed is challenging. Uh, I think they are probably out there. I think they've probably been called other things, uh, but I think the, uh, we need to come up with some validated uh, diagnostic measures as to how we can describe these, these people. Anyway, at the present time, there's, there is no uh, validated measure to diagnose individuals who are adults on the autism spectrum. The Autism Diagnostic Observational Schedule, or known as the ADOS, is really designed for children. And some people who have been doing uh, research on the adults have been attempting to use what's called Module 4, which is really designed for the high-functioning uh, verbal uh, individual on the autism spectrum, but it is not designed uh, for seniors uh, or adults. And so we really do not currently have an identifiable valid, validated measure to, to do these diagnostic tests uh, as we should. And I, this is an area that really needs exploration and um, further investigation. Uh, the ARI, the Autism Research Institute, has instituted a, a what they call a senior survey. And this was an attempt uh, to go online and to post uh, various questions for individuals uh, who are adults and most especially those over the age of 55 uh, to fill out the survey and to tell us a little bit more 
about their health care issues, their housing issues, what their interests are, what their challenges are, and so forth, in order to get an idea or begin to get an idea about what is going on in the adult population. I'm told that there are now approximately 200 individuals who have responded to this survey and that the data is now in the process of being analyzed. So hopefully we will at least have some hint uh, as to what might be going on, what perhaps uh, will drive uh, future research. Uh, <clears throat> some data does exist in terms of adults on the autism spectrum. Uh, some, uh, some seniors, but mostly regular adults under the age of 65. Um, data has come from large reviews of databases, such as the Kaiser Foundation, for example, and there's also a published review of data coming from Medicare. And mostly it highlights uh, things that are out of the database, diagnostics that are out of the database. So hypertension, cancer, uh, diabetes, and so forth, and the usual diagnoses that men, most of us would probably recognize. Uh, one of my concerns about this, these surveys is that it doesn't designate how the diagnosis of autism was made in any of these individuals. It's not clear whether these individuals that got into the database were diagnosed as children or they were diagnosed when they were older and if they were diagnosed when they were older, who made the diagnosis and how accurate the diagnosis might be. Uh, secondly, there is a, a number of comments made on, on both of these uh, projects that I mentioned where it, it highlights dementia. Dementia is not defined in terms of what they mean by dementia. And I find that also extremely challenging. I, I think there are, I'm going to discuss this a little bit more later in, the, in my conversation here. But I think that, that what they mean by de dementia really is not defined. And again, who is making the diagnosis and how that decision has been made remains to be determined. So what are some of the medical challenges that are uh, uh, out there for adults on the spectrum and most especially for the aging population. There's the issue of simply finding a primary care physician who knows anything about autism in the adult world. And this is extremely challenging because in large part our medical schools have not trained our adult doctors either in primary care or any of the specialties to work with the, this population, which perhaps is somewhat shocking given the increasing prevalence rates. So trying to find an adult doctor in any specialty or even as a primary care physician for an individual on the spectrum is, uh, is extremely challenging to say the least. And what's happened, at least in some areas of this country, is that those of us in child neurology or developmental pediatrics have been um, hanging on to our childhood patients as they emerge into the adult world because there's no one else to pick, pick us up. And that's probably not quite a, as appropriate as it might be. I think we're all doing it. Uh, I think we enjoy doing it. It's fun watching to see people uh, emerge into adulthood and find out what, how, how they're doing. But the, the adult world needs to take over uh, some of this responsibility and uh, we have to do a better job of training. We then have issues with going to the emergency room, which I'll mention a little bit more about. There's insurance coverage. A lot of our adults are covered by uh, Medicare or some other kind of public insurance, even if they have secondary insurance, and how much of that is going to get covered uh, for the, the multiple problems that perhaps some of these people have is uh, unclear. And then there are the medical concerns, which we'll get into a little bit more, about uh, things such as medications. Do adults on the spectrum respond the same way to medications as the neurotypical person? Maybe yes, maybe no. We've got gastrointestinal issues, we've got obesity, we've got seizures, the usual things that most people uh, go to see a doctor about. And are we really providing the kind of care that we need uh, for uh, adults on the spectrum? So uh, just to comment a little bit more about the primary care physician uh, shortage, really. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, most, most if not all of them really have had no experience with autism or um, have had any training in autism. And I, I, I don't know how we can move this forward. I think it has to come through medical schools, training uh, medical students, but also in their postgraduate courses, so their internships, their residencies and actually have 
on-site experience with those individuals, not just reading it out of the book. That's not going to help. There's too much heterogeneity in this disorder and one has to really work with the individuals on the spectrum. And then there's the issue that, that the average autistic person is time consuming. Uh, many of them are nonverbal. They can't tell the uh, story about how they feel. Uh, they can have behavioral problems. They may not want to step on the scale, for example. Uh, they may want to not want to have a blood pressure taken. And so someone has to spend a lot of time trying to prep them for all this. And so, so your average primary care physician is running on a tight schedule because that means that he or she is, is uh, going to lose money if they don't see, you know, five patients an hour or what have you. And so this is, this is pretty stressful on both sides. Uh, paperwork, there's a lot of paperwork forms to be filled out for the insurance cover and so forth. And, and then as I said, uh, the insurance cover and reimbursement for adults on the spectrum are, is not fabulous. I mean, these, they're not, these, these doctors are not going to make a lot of money seeing uh, large numbers of folks with special needs and most especially those on, on the autism spectrum who are time consuming. So there are a number of challenges here. Um, the emergency room is a, is a particular kind of challenge uh, because it's noisy, it's a new environment, uh, the people working with the individual doesn't know them, they don't know their, you know, they have to touch them, they have to um, take them out of their routine, uh, there's a lack of communication, uh, and it's really extremely stressful, not only for the patient, but for, for everybody else who's trying to get things done in a very busy emergency room. I think some hospitals tried to find a, a navigator who works with somebody in the autism world. When they come to the emergency room, that will sort of uh, handle some of these, these stressful situations. But not all hospitals have that as yet. It's a good step forward. It probably isn't the whole answer, but at least it's, it's a step in the right direction. So what medical conditions are we talking about here? Well, it's, uh, there's no reason to think that, that individuals on the spectrum should in, in many ways be any different than anybody else. Uh, so we certainly have seen uh, cancer, um, I guess in my own practice. I have uh, one young man who passed away with a, a brain glioma, uh, glioblastoma, when he was in his 20s. I have another one who's got thyroid cancer that seems to be holding pretty well. And then uh, an older adult who's just been diagnosed with prostate cancer, and we'll get back into that a bit. So it does occur. I don't know how frequently it occurs, nor do we have data about how frequently it occurs. And are, are autistic people more prone to have cancer or, or not so much? Maybe they're just like everybody else, but we don't have that data. We certainly know about seizures. Uh, that's been a long-term problem for folks on the spectrum. Uh, and uh, that's been managed in the usual ways. Uh, metabolic disorders, certainly it can be a fo focus, cardiovascular disorders, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, uh, gastrointestinal disorders, which uh, it's become probably is much more prevalent than we're even acknowledging, and depending upon who you read, can vary from you know up to 83% of the population to maybe something like 40 or 50, but it really depends upon who's reporting it. Obesity and then tardive dyskinesia, which often is related to medication. So there are a number of issues here that, that need to be dealt with and explored. And honestly, we really do not have the data to say how frequent any of this is in this population. Chronic pain is a tremendous problem because these individuals don't typically tell us that they're uncomfortable or in pain, at least not in the usual way. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later, but oftentimes this is expressed through various behaviors. Dental issues, um, how, many, how many of these folks actually get regular dental care? Uh, they see their dentist, do they go regularly every three months to get a cleaning like some other people do? Or do they just never show up at the dental office unless some tragedy happens? Sleep disorders are very common. Uh, there's uh, sleep apnea, they have a number of adults now who are using CPAP machines, or in fact, they won't use the CPAP machine because they don't like the touch of the, the mask on their face. So what, what are you going to do about that? That's a challenge. Uh, many of them have balance and motor challenges, so they're, not, uh, they, they're prone to falls, for example. Sensory issues, I mean, how many, again, how, get regular vision ch challenge to go, to go to the ophthalmologist to see whether they need glasses or not? I mean, I can't think of any uh, adult that I see at this point that, that goes regularly for any kind of testing like that. If they're testing hearing, you know, the people as they age have hearing parent, uh, problems. Do many of these folks get their hearing tested as an adult? 
vestibular issues, tactile, taste, smell, any of those things can also affect diet and, uh, and uh, food intake. So there are a number of here challenges here that we really haven't addressed in this, in this population that do need to be addressed and addressed regularly. Uh, then there's the issue of mental distress. We, we even talked about, we talked about physical things, but what about mental health? High, high incidences of anxiety, uh, not only just in the adults, but also in the, in the uh, children, adolescents, and young adults uh, is, has, has been well established. Depression, I don't think anybody is really looking at the frequency of depression or post-traumatic stress. And then there's this issue of dementia that I've already uh, raised the question about. I don't know what people are talking about when they talk about dementia. I'll again talk about that a little bit later. And social isolation, and certainly this has become very prominent with the advent of COVID and the pandemic where all of us has been socially isolated, but this has really had a tremendous negative effect on uh, all the, the autism population as a whole, but certainly uh, the adults in, in who had typically had been gone to a, a day program. Well, they haven't been able to go to the day program or they've done it by Zoom or, or something like that, but it's, it's socially isolating and it's had a tremendous negative impact. Um, so what, what medical conditions are we, how, how can we address medical conditions on the, in the individuals on the spectrum? One of the biggest challenges that a, is that a lot of these medical conditions present, present differently in individuals on the spectrum. They don't typically show up in the office and say, I've got pain in my stomach or I'm, you know, I'm pointing to my stomach or whatever it is if they have a, a, a challenge. And one of the uh, an anecdote that I will share is that I have a, had a young woman in, in her early 20s who came to my office and she was hitting her heads and the one and she was hypoverbal and the one thing that she could say was head hurts and she was doing this repetitive head banging behavior and she'd come with her parents and the parents had indicated that they thought she had headaches and um, because this is what the area that I'm interested in uh, I suggested that they really needed to see a gastroenterologist. There was no GI symptoms here. There was no constipation, no diarrhea, no anything, that, but she was hitting her head saying head hurts. So anyway, fortunately, they didn't think I was totally crazy. And they went to see the gastroenterologist and uh, he did an endoscopy, found that she had esophagitis. He treated the esophagitis and the head hurts and head banging went away. Uh, so it, I think in this case, it simply meant I didn't. I don't feel well. It didn't mean my head hurts, and I think these people have very limited ways of letting us know that they're uncomfortable, and they may come up with various other strategies, some of which is behavioral, and uh, we have to learn how to interpret a lot of that uh, much better than we are. And physicians are not trained to do that. If in fact she had gone to another gastroenterologist who didn't have a, an awareness of uh, autism and its unusual symptoms, uh, then this could have just been passed over. So anyway, so, so the point of the conversation is that, that atypical behaviors and disruptive behaviors can often be signs of pain and discomfort. And it, do, it, it can be deceiving and people will then tend to treat the pain and start treating the, treat the symptoms and not try to find out what the underlying medical conditions are that are causing the symptoms. And therefore, a number of folks get stuck on medications that perhaps they really aren't, uh, that haven't really been beneficial uh, for them because they're treating the wrong thing. Uh, sleep problems we've already talked about, and some of that can be GI related as well, largely because uh, one can have gastroesophageal reflux disease, when one lines down, the, some of the gastric acids slither up back up the esophagus and get into the back of the throat, which keep people awake. Uh, and if there's esophagitis, as we've already talked about in this one patient, that can be pain, painful and uncomfortable and can also lead to uh, disruptive behaviors and sleep disturbances. So just to make some comments here about the kinds of behaviors that a gastroenterologist who is knowledgeable about uh, autism might see or consider thinking that this is that these behaviors may be GI related. Uh, one of them is gulping or neck stretching. So I've seen that a number of times, uh, where uh, people will sit in their in their chairs or stand in their neck, and they will do a lot of this gulping and neck stretching behaviors. I had a young man who came to see me in one of my clinics who walked into the office uh, and immediately went over to the sink and pushed his stomach against uh, the 
uh, sink in the in the in the office there. And I was working with an occupational therapist, and she, who very knowledgeably said, I think he's got gastrointestinal problems, which indeed was the case. Putting pressure on your abdomen uh, can be a sign. Tapping on the chest, disruptive sleep patterns that we've already talked about, self-injurious behavior can uh, be associated with gastrointestinal distress, aggressions, unexplained tantrums, chewing on not edibles. Why should that be related to um, GI problems? Well, the theory is that if you have irritability in your esophagus, your chewing on not edible items creates more saliva, and the saliva then is uh, soothing to the esophagus. And this that would be similar to um, a lot of drinking and snacking, for example, which does the same thing. It, it has a soothing effect on the esophagus, is the theory. And uh, that does seem to be the case, at least in some uh, some situations. So there are a number of factors that someone have to, somebody has to be alert to some of these behaviors that might be a signal that this person needs to have a further assessment by a gastroenterologist. Um, what about preventive screening? We've sort of raised that already a little bit um, early on, but how, how many individuals on the autism spectrum get the kind of present, preventive screening? that your neurotypical adult probably gets. How many adult women go and get a mammogram every year if they have a developmental disability or they have autism? How many go get dental care? How many, how many adult males have um, screening for prostate cancer, for example? Uh, how many women who have um, premenstrual um, syndrome get treated appropriately? And I would hazard to guess that, that the numbers are down and there are a number of papers here that I've alluded to in this slide, which raise those those questions. These are, these have been studied, and and they are under underutilized services. And I think this is a, a huge um, detriment to the, the population as a whole. If we if we can't identify them early enough uh, to to prevent some of the more serious symptoms, then we're not doing them any favors at all. We're not we're not giving them the health health care that they need. So what are the diagnostic challenges? Well, we need um, validated and reliable diagnostic tools, as we've started off this conversation with, to re even identify who these individuals are. Some of them may not have been picked up when they were children, maybe, particularly since the definition has been expanded over the years. It's probably some of the higher functioning individuals may have been missed. Some of them have been uh, probably diagnosed with some kind of um, psychiatric disorder, so mood disorders, bipolar disorders, uh, depression, and so forth, So, who really may have um, uh, autism. And quite honestly, along those lines, I'll be beginning to see, uh, particularly adult women, uh, I've seen a number in my clinic now in their 30s and 40s, who have come into the clinic and who clearly are on the spectrum, but have clo never been diagnosed as such. Uh, they, their eye contact is not good, they want to be alone, they have, they're, they're, have no interest in leaving their house, for example, and so forth. So I think there are probably a large number of folks out there, I don't think we have any idea about how many, uh, whose, not, whose diagnoses have been missed. We've got many who are nonverbal and can't indicate their symptoms, as we've already talked about. Uh, many of them don't even, aren't even able to localize what it is that they don't feel good about. So when I gave a, con a talk one previously, I remember that some young woman came up to me afterwards, a high-functioning Asperger uh, individual, uh, and said to me, um, thank you very much for this talk. She said, when I get sick, it takes me three days to figure out what's wrong with me. And this is somebody who is, who is clearly very bright, uh, but still is having trouble localizing what it is that she doesn't feel good about. Uh, so I think that we have, uh, challenges as it relates to sensory awareness here uh, that are, are impacting our ability to be accurate about our diagnoses. We have individuals who are very uh, restricted in terms of their dietary intake. Uh, that can certainly lead to nutritional concerns, but it also, I think, is related to some of the sensory processing uh, issues that have to be dealt with. Uh, parting words here, or what needs to be done. Um, many medical problems from the childhood era, era continue into adulthood. It, it's not like all of this is just going to disappear and uh, things will be lovely. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, but some of your adults are going to continue to have the sensory differences and create challenges for medical care. Uh, the quality of medical care for aging and autism is very deficient. 
uh, it, and physician exposure and training, as we've mentioned earlier, continues to be a serious uh, challenge. I wanted to make a comment about what, why, why should we be concerned about aging, other than, I guess, just prove up being, uh, being good citizens and trying to be sure that everybody is taken care of from the health care perspective. I think that if we know more about uh, aging and autism, it may be enlighten us a little bit more about the underlying neurobiological mechanisms that relate to autism. So for example, um, this issue of dementia. Uh, it's been established or commented on or observed for many years that once an individual on the autism spectrum leaves school, they tend to, so many of them, many of them will tend to lose some of the skills that they had previously acquired. And the theory has always been that there's, there's a lack of stimulation and many of the day programs perhaps aren't providing uh, the kind of stimulation that many of these folks can benefit from. Uh, they uh, some in, in, Right now it's, it's very hard to even find a day program that will accept somebody because there's a staff shortage. So a lot of them are sitting at home not being stimulated at all. So is this what's being interpreted as dementia? I mean, the, the fact that somebody isn't demented, they're simply not being stimulated, so they're losing some of the skills that they had before. I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's an important question. What's intriguing even more so, however, is the fact that there are a number of papers published that have raised the question about whether the underlying neurobiology of the autistic brain has some protective mechanisms. Uh, and I'll just raise one situation here where the authors hypothesized that the hyperplasticity that one sees in an autistic brain could potentially be protective against Alzheimer's disease. And up to this point, I don't know of any articles that have been published about Alzheimer's disease and autism, nor have I, in my experience, seen or heard of any patients on the autism spectrum who have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. When these folks who have reviewed these databases have looked at the uh, databases and reported, quote, dementia, if they don't specifically say what kind of dementia this is, how they made that diagnosis, and so forth. So I think this is an open question. It may be that uh, adults on the spectrum do have Alzheimer's disease, and they simply haven't been recognized as such, but we don't really know. And I think this is an intriguing question, and I think that this, along with many other reasons, really highlight the importance of trying to understand what what the brain does as it ages in this particular disorder, and is it very similar to the typical person or not? My, my guess is probably not, but I don't think we really know for sure, and I think this opens up at grand, big, big avenues uh, for research. Uh, so my parting words here is that, that we need to make some steps, substantial changes here, that family and professional advocacy groups need to get um, get pushing on terms of trying to get better services for the older population. Now that we're finally recognizing that the older population is present and growing, uh, this is becoming an increasing need. Uh, the, the greater awareness of the needs of the aging population, what what do they need? Is it different or the same of what, what everybody else gets? And even if it's what neurotypical people get, are we ensuring that they're actually getting the preventive care and the daily uh, or regular health care needs that they get from people who know autism and can understand some of the, the atypicalities of the disorder. We need validated measures to diagnose autism, uh, which we've mentioned earlier, and most especially the, the awareness, increased awareness of the atypical presentation of a lot of the medical symptoms and, and disorders uh, that these individuals have. So and the upshot of this talk is to really now raise awareness as to the needs of autistic adults and, and particularly the aging population. Uh, there used to be uh, this um, comment that uh, autism led to early mortality, early death. I have not seen that. I don't think that's true. I don't know whether that came out of uh, data that had to do with early injury for children who drowned or what have you, but I have personally have not seen this in the aging population. I have seen no reason why, to, why individuals on the spectrum should be at high risk for early death, and I think that we're going to recognize that more as we learn more about 
uh, the older groups and they can become more evident to us. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done here and I hope this talk will start stimulating uh, further investigation with this population. Thank you very much and it was been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, that was a really interesting and an extremely important um, uh, talk that you provided to us. Um, it seems to me that one of the most important sort of headline issues um, that you made in your talk, if I understood you correctly, is that um, it's not uncommon in persons with autism to have a behavior or set of behaviors that may be reflective of some ongoing abnormal medical condition mm -hmm. and that um, it would be inappropriate for a clinician to automatically dismiss um, a behavior as simply a behavior in a person with autism and instead think a bit deeper and ask oneself could there be an underlying medical process such as a gastrointestinal disturbance or a dental issue or a urinary tract infection? Did I hear you correctly? And if so, can you comment a bit more on this topic? Yes, that's absolutely correct. Uh, I, think it, I, I think that we have misinterpreted these behaviors for a long time and they have been seen simply as behaviors. Uh, I, I think it's not only behaviors, though. I, I, there are a number of issues here. First of all, it, again, it comes from the education of the, of the doctors and the, and the healthcare environment. And this doesn't have anything, I got back to the issue of the behavior, but I want to bring one other comment out here. I saw a young man with, who had, when part of my examination found him to have big tonsils and adenoids, and he was having trouble with sleep. He's on the spectrum. So I sent him to an ear, ear, nose, and I said to the parent, you need to see an ear, nose, and throat specialist because you've got big tonsils and adenoids. And she comes back, and the mother comes back for the follow-up visit, and I said, you know, how did things go, and did you see Dr. So-and-so? And she said yes, and I said, well, what did he say? And she said, yeah, he's got big tonsils and adenoids. And I said, okay, so is he going to take them out? And he, she said, no. And I said, well, why not? And she answered me, because he's got autism. Okay, that doesn't help me, and it doesn't help this child. That's totally inappropriate. I don't care what the child has in terms of a diagnosis. He's got big tonsils and adenoids, and he can't breathe, and he can't sleep, so he needs to have his tonsils taken out. So I think there is still this attitude in, in many healthcare environments where these, these kids are simply just seen as, as having behaviors or having some of these other healthcare issues and really, uh, you know, after all, they're just autistic people, so, you know, we don't have to do anything about it. And it's totally inappropriate. I mean, it's unethical to say the very least. Uh, so I think that when somebody sees an individual who has behaviors, be a child, an adolescent, or adult, I, my recommendation is that you start going down your list of saying, okay, is it gastrointestinal? Is it dental? Is it, does he have an ear infection? Uh, did he break a bone? You know, what kind, he, the patient is not going to be able to tell you for the most part. Even somebody who's verbal may not be accurately able to tell you how they feel. So I think the physician or the healthcare provider needs somehow to just start thinking about out of the box out of their own comfort zone, frankly, uh, what other disorders might be causing this behavior? Rather than simply saying, oh, well, we're going to put him on Respidol or we're going to put him on some antipsychotic to control his behavior, which I think still happens more than I would care to imagine. And I think if we can identify some of these health care issues, uh, we probably will get, I won't, I'm not saying we don't, we're going to get rid of all of them. I don't mean that at all. And I think there are probably folks who still will want to do uh, use medications. Our medications will be an adjunct and probably appropriately so, but I certainly would want to be sure that I'm not missing something else. So another anecdote would be uh, a young man who is, this is a young man, 12 year old, uh, who I called sort of the, he just this, he kind of this large kid who is just um, 
very, very quiet. And all. Anyway, so his mother called me on a Sunday to tell me that she was locked in her bathroom because he was acting out and he was attacking her and being very, very aggressive. And of course, her husband was out of town, which often happens <laughs> when something like this happened. And she didn't know what to do. And I said, well, you really need to go to the emergency room. And she's, well, I, you know, and I said, well, maybe you can get somebody for the school to go with you. And she said, she said, well, I want to come down to Boston, to the, the, the hospital down there. They lived in New Hampshire. And I said, you know, I think you really need to go to closer, but no, no, I want to come to Boston. Anyway, they, long story short, they ended up at the psychiatric emergency room at uh, as it turned out, was Mass General Hospital. And most, in my experiences, mostly has been that psychiatrists, and they, they won't shoot me down, uh, don't typically physically examine somebody, but apparently that particular night they did. And they found out that he had an ear infection. And so he got treated with antibiotics. They shot him with the antibiotics. He went to sleep in the emergency room. The next morning he got up, everything was fine. He walked out the door. <laughs> And I think he, what, what happened was that he was pain, in pain because of his ear infection, had these behaviors. Fortunately, somebody examined him. Fortunately, they treated him with, started treating him with the antibiotics in the emergency room. And the next day, he piece of cake, out he walked, and everything was fine. So I think, you know, we just have to be cautious about, you know, treating these behaviors and just seeing them as behaviors. And I think I, my recommendation would be, yes, we need to go down our whatever laundry list we have and say, it, it could this be it, could this be it, could this be it, whatever it is. And we're not, probably can't cover, cover obviously everything, but I think we can at least cover much. Thank you. And Dr. Bowman, it also seems to me that another one of the major headline issues that you've uh, educated us about today is that there's um, a considerable intellectual desert in terms of contemporary understanding of medical issues for persons with autism as they age. Um, alongside that, can you let us know what the state of knowledge is regarding the very most basic living circumstances of most persons with autism as they age. So for example, as persons transition in with autism, transition into their 30s or 40s or 50s, 60s and 70s, what percentage are still living with their family in their home? What percentages at each of these decades are living in group homes or intermediate care facilities, or in various types of institutional settings, be they nursing homes or other institutional places. Because this is very much, it would mm -hmm. seem to me, tied into yeah. their medical care yep. and medical well-being mm -hmm. and their safety. Yep. Well, that's a really good question. And honestly, I don't think we know uh, right now. I think that was part of the survey was to find out where some of these folks were living and uh, what kind of care they were getting. And you know, the point, your point's well taken. Certainly the at least in, in Massachusetts, uh, institutions are, have been faded away. So you, we don't have institutions. And in fact, the, the state is quite hard-nosed about wanting to put anything, any person in a place that even has the, the uh, an atmosphere of an institution. So, and sometimes they're even putting their foot down in terms of group homes. Uh, a lot of our parents have created their own group homes uh, where they've created, um, they've hired their own staff bought homes themselves, you know, put their individuals in there with, with other individuals that they know are of similar age, uh, so they feel like they've got more control over it. There are now uh, more states, I think Massachusetts is just coming into this, but New Hampshire has been doing, which they call self-directed care, where the state al allocates a certain amount of money to the family, and the family then creates its own uh, idea of what they want to do, so there's a lot of shared living that's going on now. I've seen increasing amounts of that where they, somebody has a two-bedroom apartment, uh, they, uh, pa the patient lives in one room or the mentor or guardian or companion, whatever, uh, has the other one and <clears throat> that this is, it is supported by what's called sex Section 8 housing. So that, that's, that seems to be a much more desirable situation for many of these patients. Sometimes families will build onto their own homes, so it's sort of like an in-law apartment, and they will make arrangements that way. 
Uh, so I think people are trying to come up with different strategies about what to do. I think my, my concerns about the group homes, uh, and some of them are excellent, but some of them, uh, again, um, are some of them are, are challenging for a number of reasons. For, so the Department of Developmental Services in, in Massachusetts, and I know that everybody's strapped and that there is a, a staffing shortage, but sometimes they will just put a, somebody in a group home because that's what happens to be what's available. And the, the staff has no knowledge of autism whatsoever. They just got put in this place because there was a place that was vacant. Uh, so I think families have to begin to start their search much earlier when, when they're making transitional planning for their teenagers about what happens after the age of 21 or 22 so that they don't get stuck in some place that they, they don't belong. I think one of the other challenges is that there's low pay for the staff, so there's a lot of turnover oftentimes. Uh, so a lot of the staff are not necessarily well trained. Uh, even b before they get there. So again, there are huge challenges here. What happens with the aging population? Uh, this is an unknown as far as I'm, I know. I mean, I, I have folks in their 50s and 60s who are um, living in group homes and so far the ones I know of are being reasonably well cared for. But I may have, I may have a select population. I have one man in his 50s who is in one of these shared arrangements with the apartment. I've got another one who is in a group home with three or four other adults on the spectrum, but has his own bedroom. And there's somebody there that's 24-hour uh, care and so forth and so on. So, uh, but I, I think it's really not known. I mean, I don't know where all the people who are in their 60s and 70s are, frankly. I, that, that was the purpose of the survey. It was just, where are they living? Where are these adults? They've got to be out there someplace, but I don't know that we've got a handle on where they are, frankly. Thank you, Dr. Bauman. Uh, one final question. As you have repeatedly pointed out, um, persons with autism have impairments in communicative skills. And um, as they age, and as their parents are aging mm -hmm. and themselves acquire disability or die, the opportunity for parents and guardians to provide accurate mm -hmm. information regarding the person's health, both past and present, is diminished. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that there's a tool that's available that is not being frequently used mm -hmm. that has tremendous power, and that is the video. Yep. Uh, could you comment on the potential use of video to aid in the medical care provided by primary care physicians as well as specialists such as neurologists? Sure. Okay. Um, I will make one, give you one anecdote for that. I, had a, I, I think it's huge. Everybody's got a cell phone. There's certainly no reason why you can't just click on your cell phone and take whatever video you're going to take. But I had a, a young man who came, came in who's a four-year-old. I was the third neurologist. The story was he was having seizures. The other two neurologists didn't know what to do. They'd done all this medication and blah, 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 and things. The kids still having the seizures. Two-thirds through the visit, the mother turns out her cell phone. She says, I have a video of one of these episodes. She turns on the video, and I looked at it, and I said, this is not seizure. This is GI. The little boy was uh, curled up on the floor. He was crunched over. He was cl clutching his stomach and so forth. Uh, happily, I sent him to a gastroenterologist who had a uh, cancellation the next week. This was a California uh, client. Uh, I get back to Boston and I get an email, email from the gastroenterologist that said esophagitis, good call. Okay, so this made a huge difference for me. I mean, when I'm listening to what the parent was saying, I could have interpreted what she was telling me as being seizure. I understand why other, I'm not been, I'm not nailing the other doctors for making the wrong diagnosis. But it, once you see it, you realize that you misinterpreted what the parent was actually saying or what the relative was saying. So I think there is a huge benefit for getting any kind of video. I think the other thing I would really like to see is some kind of, um, we've all got technology and we've all got iPod, iPads or laptops or something, some kind of form that parents will fill out 
as they go along that would just sort of a record of medical records that are sort of kept long term so that you know when somebody is 60 or 70 one can look back and say well you know he, he was born this way and this is how he acted when he was two and something that would give some documentation I think that's possible. The video could also serve a potent role as part of a longitudinal uh, record. Sure, perfect. And you could see neurologically and developmentally yes. how a person Absolutely. was at time point A yeah. and see how they are now. Perfect. Yep, I agree. And we've got the technology to do it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bowman. This is really excellent. Well, thank you for your excellent. Today. Thank you for your excellent questions.